All right, welcome to uh, CS 4510. I believe this is lecture LO8A. Uh, the topic of today is on Turing machines. Um, so today is the first day of class. Uh, none of that mattered. None of that was important. All that was, you can forget it, honestly. Uh, well, don't. It's sort of a. It's sort of the prerequisite and the preliminary knowledge needed for this class, and that begins today. Um, a Turing machine. I also want to say that this is a, a very robust uh, kind of automaton. This is perhaps the best and only automaton ever. And we'll talk very extensively about the definition, not just the definition itself, but why is it a good definition. And that makes the second half of today my favorite lecture of the entire course. Um, a Turing machine. Uh, is another generalization of an automaton that we've seen before. So we noted that DFAs were weak, and then we gave them, a, we gave an NFA a stack, and that's how we got a PDA. Um, but as we've seen, that a PDA itself is also kind of weak. We gave a PDA to decide the language a to the n, b to the n, and is a number. Um, and again, the PDA, giant CRT monitor, Apple IIe, e, whatever. And then it's got this input it can read and write. It can't write to it. It can only move left and read it, move right on this and read it. And then there's a stack, which is unbounded, that it can push and pop from, and it can only read the top of the stack. So we took a DFA, and we gave it an auxiliary memory structure. And um, given this auxiliary memory structure, we, it was able to read, excuse me, it was able to decide A to the N, B to the N. But we proved via the pumping lemma and the equivalence of context-free grammars and pushing on automaton that it could not decide a to the n, b to the n, c to the n, n is a number. Right? In some sense, it was good enough to decide this language, but not good enough to decide this one. In some sense, this one requires memorizing two things, doing two things at a time. This can only memorize one-ish thing of an arbitrary size, but still one thing. Um, the limitation of the PDA is like, Sure, you can remember some stuff, but once you pop it out of the stack, unless you push it back in immediately, it's forgotten. It's lost into the ether. It's thrown in the garbage. And that prevents you from reading arbitrarily deep in the stack in a lossless way. This one, somehow you'd have to remember A's to B's and B's to C's and A's to C's or something like this, right? It's something more complicated. We're in pursuit of an automata, a model of computation which is strong enough to encapsulate a good definition of algorithm as in the one that you and I use when we compute things, or uh, anything that a computer uses. you know. Uh, and so far, we've seen that the PDA and, of course, the DFA and NFA fail. Um, so a stack is not exactly the memory structure we need. Uh, what are other uh, data structures that we could give to automatons? Two stacks. Two stacks. That was definitely a problem. We'll talk about a two-stack PDA on Tuesday. What's another data structure, though? A two-stack PDA, actually provably, because your homework problem was to prove that a two-stack PDA could decide WW uh, w in sigma. And we proved that this, oh, excuse me, WW, W's in sigma. And we proved that this can't be done by a pushdown automaton or context feed grammar. Means that the two-stack PDA certainly is stronger than the one-stack PDA. But we'll talk about the two-stack PDA a little more in depth last time. What's another um, uh, data structure? Queue? A queue is like when you get in line at the grocery store. Like, what is it? The, uh, a stack is first in, first out. A, a queue is last in, first out, right? First in, last out, something like that. Um, a queue is, how would you implement a stack or a queue, though? There's an even simpler, more primitive data type than a queue. A list or an array. So that's all a Turing machine is. If a PDA is simply we gave an NFA and a stack. Uh, a Turing machine, named after Alan Turing, is simply if we gave a DFA uh, a tape or an array. We'll call it a tape. A tape, uh, let me show you what a Turing machine looks like, of course, because that's our picture of a PDA. We, of course, have to see what a, a Turing machine looks like. It's got a bunch of states going on, something like this. And then there's like a little, something like that. Got like a paper clip. And then we got this tape.
something like this. I'm not an artist. Um, so basically, you got an automaton, and it's got a little sensor on it. It's called it's called a tape head. The tape head has this ability to read and write to this tape. The tape is infinite, quote unquote, not perhaps usefully so, but it's arbitrarily long in one direction. I mean, no one would say the stack is infinite, but this, but the tape we declare to be infinite, but not infinite in, in use. Um, it has this little sensor, this what's called the tape head. And the tape head iterates over the tape in a linear fashion. It can read and write symbols to the tape. So it reads a symbol off the tape, and then it can write a symbol to the tape, and then it can move left or right exactly one square. So it reads, writes, reads, writes, reads, writes, right? Very s extremely simple, extremely trivial device. Um, the formal definition, of course, will elucidate all the little missing pieces. Q, sigma, gamma, Q0, excuse me, delta. Q0, QA, uh, and QR. Slightly different than the ones we've seen before, yet also simultaneously the same. Q is going to be a finite set of states. Q0, <laughs> QA, and QR. Right? There's three special states this time, uh, this time. A QA and a QR. We'll talk about what those are in a second. But Q is the set of states. And again, you transition between those states according to this transition function. Uh, sigma is the input alphabet. It's probably like A, B, or it's probably uh, 0, 1. Gamma is a what's called the t a finite tape alphabet. Like, like the PDA had a stack alphabet, a Turing machine has a tape alphabet. And uh, we're going to enforce a stronger convention than we did for the PDA, because the input is going to have to go on the tape. So we require the following three things. Uh, sigma is a strict subset of uh, gamma. The empty s s symbol, this is called a blank. It's, it's a, denoted as an underscore with little tiny tabs on the end, like a loose staple. This is a, a special symbol, which is an element of gamma. And we also make sure that the blank is not and never an element of sigma. Conventionally, what this means is that we'll usually have gamma just be sigma union, the special symbol. The tape has been pre-allocated with all these little blanks on it for us. Um, we'll talk about Q0. Q0 is a special start state. It's just the way you start. QA, QR are accept, reject states appropriately. Right? One, QA is the accept. QR is the reject state. Now, the Turing machine will accept not by just dying and landing on an accept state. Notice that the PDA has like two things going on. We, the Turing machine ends up being powerful enough, we can just put two, we can just put the input on the tape. So I'll just describe it in a second, but we initialize the uh, Turing machine with the input on the tape, leftmost, and then the rest of the tape is considered to be initialized with blanks. Um, gamma, excuse me, not gamma, Initial, it, it, the tape is initialized with blanks. The machine doesn't just land on a state and then decide to accept. It must explicitly accept by transitioning to one of these two states. QA and QR are two specially defined states that have no outgoing transitions. Think of them closer, not to states where you just happen, like in a DFA where you just happen to land and you, that's where you, the cards fall. You must end there. QA and QR are states that you accept or reject only if you want to. Think of them closer to instructions. You call the stop instruction. You push the big red button. That's when you stop, not when you just happen to stop, like a PDA. PDA stops when you run out of input, and you only, you only take so many epsilon transitions out of there. Uh, the Turing machine has to, tell, has to execute a stop. The transition function delta is always interesting. Uh, we, the definition of Turing machine we'll use is explicitly deterministic. So there's not going to be a power set in the codomain. But what it's going to look like is we're going, to, we're going to start at some state, and then we're going to read a symbol off the input. Excuse, excuse me. We're going to read a symbol off the tape. Then we're going to transition states, write a symbol, and then move left or right. 
So what that means is like this, we have qi, qj. If we see read a, write b, move left, what that means is read a, write b, and then move left. So this transition would be taken if the current position of the tape head is over a symbol that says a, right? And again, read, write, move. And then this is how we change the states. Again, notice no power set. It's a deterministic transition function. We'll, do, we'll spend the first half of today's lecture simply on programming, on constructing, constructing, construction of several Turing machines, right? Uh, how is the Turing machine initialized? Well, the tape is, begin, is, be, is begun in this way. If the, input is, if, if the input is w is equal to w1 to wn, the tape is initialized with those symbols on the tape. Then everything after is considered to be blanks. Right? So the first n symbols of the tape are filled with the input. The remaining symbols are, we would say, are uninitialized, perhaps, or have allocated themselves to be blanks. The tape head is initialized to be in the left most, left, leftest most position, and the start state is Q0. So the tape head is going to be here, and then it's going to be over W1. It's the first symbol it reads. Then it moves left, then it moves right. right. Any questions so far on just the definition of a Turing machine? There may be one that you have as the way I've presented it. There's one unanswered question. How do you stop? You stop, you, the machine only stops when it transitions to one of these special states, QA or QR. Only then it stops, right? The PDA defines stops after it's out of input. Here, the input is on, on the memory structure. You couldn't do this with a PDA. You couldn't fill the stack with the input because then you pop it off. You, to read it, you're out of, you're out of control. You, know? you have nothing left to do. There's one more, there's any more questions on this? What happens if it doesn't stop? Like, what does that mean? Ah, we'll talk about that very extensively. A Turing machine, unlike other automatons, is allowed to get stuck in an infinite loop. These are useless machines in some sense. We'll talk about this extensively. But um, there are machines you can construct, and we'll do so later today, of infinite loop Turing machines. That is an important distinction between a Turing machine and other objects immediately. You, you can, uh, a PDA may be poorly programmed, but it'll always terminate. A uh, Turing machine may not terminate some sense. Uh, the question I was hoping someone would ask is what happens if you're at the leftmost cell and you try to move left, right? The tape head can go click, 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 click. What happens if you try to move left off the end of the tape? And it turns out it doesn't really matter. Conventionally, we'll just say that the read and the write occur, but then the left doesn't happen. There's like a wall there. You like try to move left and you overpower the 3D printer, 3D printer head thing and it just like stays there. So it's, it, it just is above the same symbol. You can use that to your advantage in certain programming. It doesn't particularly matter. This is just one definition of a Turing machine. Any questions on this one? All right, let's program. Uh, well, let's talk about uh, configurations of a Turing machine. So a configuration is an instant, instantaneous snapshot. A configuration is just a, you have the machine, computation is a process, it's going through certain steps one at a time. A configuration is a, is a you take a photo of, of the machine in some instant step. And a configuration contains all the information that is an instant of the machine. So what are some, what is, and given the configuration, you can uniquely determine what the machine was doing at that exact moment. If you're familiar with VMware, you, you can click the little snapshot button. It saves a copy of everything that occurred. That everything is all the registers, all the RAM, the display, I think. I don't know the, where the mouse is, everything, right? So what sh information should a configuration contain? It should contain uh, the current tape. It should contain the tape head position. Like which cell is the, is the tape head currently hovering over? Which is the next thing it's going to read? There's one more th important piece of information a configuration must contain. Current state. Current state. 
It turns out these are the only three things that need to be encoded into a configuration. And you could encode them in like a struct or something, but conveniently we'll con encode them into a specific string. So uh, if the machine is something like this, let's say, I'll even, un let's look just near the tape head for now. Let's say we have A, B, C, and D. And let's say we're hovering over C with on state QI. Okay? This is an instant of the machine. The way we, we can describe the snapshot of the machine at this moment is with the string A, B, Q, I, C, D. So what you do to the configuration syntax is you take the tape with uh, not all the infinitely many blanks. You just take the current written portions of the tape, which may contain some blanks. But you take the tape, you insert the, a symbol for the state next to the letter that it's reading. This is supposed to mean the tape is A, B, C, D. The head is pointing at C, because that's the next symbol after this Q. And Q, I is the current state that we're at. That's what a configuration syntax is. Um, now suppose you uh, are at, we say, uh, if c, we say like C uh, yields C prime, and we say, or C and C prime are configurations, we put this symbol to mean yields. Uh, if C prime is the configuration that occurs after one application of the transition function to the uh, configuration. So suppose we are at this configuration, and our transition function will go this way. What we're going to do is read C. We're going to write, I don't know, C prime, and we're going to move uh, right. Suppose that was our transition. Given this configuration, what should the next configuration be? Read C, write C prime, move right. And let's even say you go from QI to QJ, right? What should the next configuration be? Or A, B, C prime, QJ, D. Yeah, perfect. Right? So this is a string. And we say, with this symbol yields this string if it follows after one application of the transition function. Let me rewrite this back up so you can see what it looks like. So we were here, right? We read the C, we wrote a C prime, and then we moved right. Right? That's the new configuration of the machine. And this is how we would describe it as a string. The way we, we would write this transition, though, would be like this. It would be read C, write C prime, move right. Okay. Now suppose <coughs> instead it was Q, I, read C, write C prime, but move left. We would go from A, B, Q, I, C, D to what? If instead it was a move left instead of a move right, what would it be? A, Q, J, B, C, prime, D. Yeah. The tape head, now this is a little tricky because unfortunately the string is flat, but the picture of the Turing machine is 3D. The head is pointing at B after it finishes writing C. So it reads the C, writes a C prime, and then it's going to move left. So it's going to move past the B. So it's going to be pointing now at the B. So QJB. That's the configuration. right? These are just a string encoding of a snapshot of a thing. We could have done something similar. A, a snapshot of a, a, excuse me, a configuration of a PDA would be you know, what symbol is it currently reading uh, uh, on the input, and also what's the current contents of the stack, and also the current state. Right? It's very similar. Questions on, on uh, this? Uh, of a PDA, excuse me, of a Turing machine so far, configuration syntax. Um, if I wanted to write both of these using the function notation, we would do delta of QI C is equal to the triple QJ C prime right. Right? It's state symbol, state symbol left to right. Right? Um, We say, 
uh, uh, Turing machine M accepts uh, word W if uh, accepts W e in k steps even if uh, there exists configurations uh, uh, configurations uh, c zero c k such that uh, c zero is the initial configuration q zero w one Wn, and that's always what the initial configuration is going to look like because that's the way the machine is initially allocated. Q0 is the start state, the input is W1 to Wn, and the head is pointing at uh, W1, right? Uh, for all i, uh, Ci yields Ci plus 1, and then i is for 0 through k, uh, k minus 1, and uh, Ck is accepting. And a configuration is accepting if it has QA in its, in its, uh, as a symbol, right? So there's a sequence of, a machine accepts a word if there's a sequence of configurations. And the last configuration is, is an accepting one. That's when we say a machine accepts a word. A machine analogous, analogously rejects a word if after K steps, the, the Kth configuration is a rejecting one, right? So, a machine, though, on certain inputs, perhaps all input inputs, in fact, could get stuck in an infinite loop. So we have to be a little more careful with the definition of accepting and rejecting, right? It's not just where you land, where the cards fall. Questions so far? So let's demonstrate that a Turing machine is more powerful than a PDA. We won't be able to give a direct simulation of one uh, yet, but we can kind of hint towards it by giving a Turing machine for the following language, w hash w, w is in sigma star. Now this is very close to the language that we pumped, but the only difference is this hash in there. Now, do you recall why the PDA didn't need the hash to decide this, to, excuse me, for wwr, the PDA didn't need this hash there because it could non-deterministically guess the middle. Turing machine, unfortunately, is deterministic. So if it was able to determine what the middle of the string is, it would have to do some work. We're going to give uh, a Turing machine for this language, but you should convince yourself that this language is also not context-free because it's very similar to WW, and we pumped WW, right? You could perhaps believe that the proof that this, that the proof that this language is not context-free is almost exactly identical to the proof that uh, WW is not context free. It's just going to be like one extra case, if anything. It's going to be almost identical, right? So we'll give a Turing machine uh, for this language. Now, when we did it, the PDAs, before we did each PDA, what we did was we, cons we just gave a high level algorithm of it, and then we uh, turned that high level pseudocode into a literal, into a literal state diagram. Um, let's do the same thing here again, right? So, what's your first algorithm? to be, what would your first algorithm be to determine this language? Like, given a string of this form, how would you determine it looks like that? I mean, in this case, it would probably be easiest to like, like check a letter and then move past the pound sign and then check the letter again, and like keep bouncing back and forth, because then you have the pound sign to tell you like what's happening. Exactly. Now, that's almost too simple to be explained, because a computer would do that like automatically for you or whatever, right? But that's what we would have to do here. So what we'll do is consider we have, like if we were doing this with pen and paper, let's say we have A, B, A, hash, uh, A, B, A. And then after the end of W, the tape is initialized with all these blanks, right? There's blanks after the end of the input. Now, when you were doing this with pen and paper, what you would do is you would remember this A, you would then cross it out, you would then go all the way here, and then you would see the A, and then you would, if it's equal to the A that you saw, you would cross it out. And then you would reset yourself, see the B, you would remember the B, cross it out, and then go all the way here, see a, to the first uncrossed one, and then cross that out. 
right? You would continue that process one letter at a time until uh, everything was crossed out. And if, if you ever made a mistake, or there was something not matching, or something was not crossed out, then you know that the uh, Turing machine, excuse me, you know that, you're, that the strings are different, right? So you would reject. Um, let's high level pseudocode this, and we'll just stick it in a for loop. So suppose we're at uh, x b a dot 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 hash uh, x b a dot dot dot. And x means a crossed out a, right? We see this a, what we're going to do is we're going to do, we're going to, we start here. Let's say we start there, okay? We're going to remember, uh, remember the symbol, cross it out. We're going to loop past, we're going to loop right, excuse me, loop right past unmarked, loop right over the hash, so we're going to loop past the unmarked, loop over the hash, loop past, loop right, past, marked, if first unmarked equals what remembered, cross it out, and reset. Now, to be a little more verbose, what would reset mean? You read, what I'm saying is you read the B, you cross it out, you loop past all this, you loop past that, you loop past all this. The first unmarked you see is a B. If it is the same symbol you remember, you're going to cross that out, and then you're going to reset. And now, how does reset working? Just re, we'll have to describe it a little more thoroughly. You loop past all the marked, loop past the hash, loop past all the unmarked until you find the first unmarked. Then the procedure repeats for A this time. Then it would do A, right, and so on. A little over-explained, but that's the syntax of a Turing machine. It's very primitive. It only has three instructions, a read, write, and move. But we can implement a surprising amount of things on this. Uh, yeah, let's draw the state diagram for this now. So Turing machine, big, complicated, convoluted. Uh, I'm going to allow you in your diagrams to have implicit rejection, even though technically not allowed. It'll make the diagram much simpler. Uh, such a primitive language requires uh, perhaps some shortcuts. So we must begin somewhere. Right. Humble Q0. Okay. We begin at Q0, and we want to remember the first symbol that we read. Now, how do you remember things in a Turing machine? You could write it somewhere else on the tape. That's not perhaps too useful because you want to condition on that symbol later. So what you're going to end up doing is you're going to transition to two different states. You're going to say, if I read an A, mark it with an X and move right. Or if I read a B, Mark it with an X and move right. You agree? Uh, now we marked it with the A. Now we want to move past uh, all the baggage. So what that means, if I'm going to read an A, I'm going to write the A back and move right. If I read a B, I'm going to write the B back and move right. Notice that read A, write A basically means look at and ignore. So a self-loop of read A, write A, read B, write B, move right just means keep going until what happens? When should I stop keep going? Hash. If we see the hash, we're not going to write over it. We're just going to write it back. And we're going to move right. Then we need to move past all the marked symbols, these X's that have been previously marked. So we're going to say if we read an X, we're just going to keep that unmarked and move right. Right? Now, we will stop when we see the next unmarked symbol, the first symbol that's not an x. What is that going to be? Well, we hope it's an a. So what we'll do is we'll draw it like this. If it's an a, great. Mark it and move left. Now, if it's not an a, from here, this state, suppose we just 
say it's implicit rejection. Right? But you should suppose that there is a transition defined here that says read B, write anything, trans move anything, transition to QR. Right? We have successfully read and re remembered A, moved to the corresponding A, and marked it as well. Now we need to reset ourselves. How is that going to look? We need to go back to Q0, which is like the beginning of the for loop. So what we're going to do is, well, we just, we just marked a symbol and we just moved to the left. So what we need to do is move past all the previously marked symbols, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to put a self loop here and we're going to say read an X, write an X, and move left. So we're going to keep, we went X, X, A. A, right? We marked this symbol, came over here, marked it. Now we go click, 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 click. So we're going to move past all these marked until we see the hash. So we're going to say, if we see a hash, space. We see a hash, write the hash back, and keep moving left. And then we're going to move past all these unmarked symbols. If we see an A, write an A, move left. If we see a B, write a B, move left. Right? Then we're going to, we want to end at the first unmarked symbol. How do we know where the first unmarked symbol is? Move to the first marked one and then move one over. Yeah, move, you know where the last <coughs> marked, you know where the last marked symbol is because you'll keep moving left until you read a marked symbol. So then you just immediately, after you see a mark symbol, just move left. So what we'll do is we'll keep moving over the unmarked until we see a mark symbol. Then we'll leave that mark symbol alone, but we'll move right. That's it, actually. Wow, so we did it for A's. We need to do it for B's. Excuse me while I just copy all this down. We read a B, mark an X. Skip over all the unmarked, moving right. Skip over all the Bs, moving right. If we see a hash, just j jump over it. Move right. For all the marked symbols, jump over them. Move right. And then only if you see a B will you uh, reset yourself. Mark it. Move left. Yeah. Great. Uh, we have almost everything except the stopping condition. When do you <coughs> run out? When, when should you stop? Here. We finished marking all the inputs. We said X, 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 X. What we did was we moved here. This was, this was, if this was the last letter, we marked it. We moved over here. We marked it. We reset here. And then we moved right once, right? We read the marked. Write a mark and move right. But if the last symbol we marked on the left side was the last letter of, the f of that part, then we should be reading a hash right now. So what we'll do is we'll have a little bit of a check. If we read a hash, we'll write that hash back and we'll move right. Now we need to double check that everything is in order. We don't want to accidentally accept, we want to accept only WW, not if W is a the first is a prefix of the second. So we need to ensure that there are no unmarked symbols on the right side. We're OK to assume that all the first has been marked just because of the computation of the machine. We just make sure, need to make sure the right part has no unmarked symbols. So what we'll do is we'll just make sure we loop over. Read an X, write an X, and move right. Right? Now. Uh, how do we know that we have finished marking, uh, that we, how do we know that the entire input has been marked? We hit a blank. Read a blank, write a blank, move. This part doesn't really matter. Let's say write. That's the, that's their QA. Right, we'll accept. And there's a lot of missing transitions that would all go to a Q reject. Imagine you were to write code for this and you did all the try, can't, try catch nonsense. Everywhere there's an undefined transition to suppose that directly throws you into Q reject. Right? Question? Do we need to have a movement on every single one? 
Unfortunately, yeah, because the transitions of a Turing machine come in pairs. Although you can think of it like a minimal instruction set of read, write, move, they are conditioned in a certain sense, and you have to read, have to write, and you have to move. You have to move. And oftentimes for the Turing machine, you're like, you did your last thing, and you're like, great, but the last transition has to be defined to have a move on it. Sometimes this R, it would still be correct if this was an L, turns out. It doesn't really matter. But this is a correct Turing machine uh, for it. Here's QR, Q0. All the other states, Q1, Q2, whatever. Right? Correct Turing machine. Any questions on this? If I gave you a description of a Turing machine, you should be able to go do it, right? If I asked you to give me a Turing machine, Turing machine to decide a language. Also notice, high level, very simple to explain, takes like two sentences, but it's cumbersome. As we get more and more complicated automata, we have to like get more and more complicated diagrams. It becomes a worse programming language in some sense. A DFA, really simple, really cool. A lot of moving parts here. So for a lot of things, it may help to just have a high level pseudocode uh, going in first. Questions on this one? Yes. Sure. In that middle thing, is it supposed to be x goes to x goes to left instead of xxr? Um, in the, the middle branch. Let's see. We go here? No, the one to the left. Let's see. You write the A, mark the X, move left, move over all the marked until you see a hash. Then you just step, you step over the hash. Then you skip over all the unmarked. But the second you find a marked symbol, you, read the mark, you write the marked symbol back and then you move right. So what this is going to look like, let's say you had X, X, A, and the head is coming this way, right? That, 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 that. It's going to read the x, it's going to write the x back, and then it's going to move there. So it should, because only because that's a right, will you be at the first unmarked. Are we ever going to get to that hashtag case then where we go through and we check the? This one? Yeah. This one will happen exactly when the computation looks like this. Let's say you finished marking. Let's say this was an A. You, you erased it, you put an X here, you moved over here, this was an A, well, okay. Let's say this was the, the string you're at, okay? You read the A, put an X, go here, read the A, put an X, come here, you read the first unmarked, then you're gonna move right to be at the next unmarked symbol. But you're out of this, if there's no more unmarked symbols, the next symbol you should be reading is the hash. Yeah, little programming edge cases like that. More questions on that diagram? A Turing machine, unlike uh, other kinds of automaton, is not simply a decider. It doesn't simply get to say yes or no. A grammar is a producer. A automaton is a decider. But a Turing machine is also allowed to compute. And computing Turing machines are ones that are much simpler and much nicer, in fact. Uh, so we say a function is computable, or maybe Turing computable, and the function is f from the domain of sigma star to the codomain of sigma star. It's a map of strings to strings. Uh, if there exists, exists a Turing machine m such that uh, m initialized with W on its tape halts with only F of W. So a, a function is said to be computable or Turing computable if there exists a Turing machine to compute. What we mean here is that the Turing machine, this is a Turing machine. It halts on all inputs. You give it W, it gives you F of W. It iterates over the input, does whatever it has to, and then just leaves all that, leaves only the answer there. The Turing machine has an arbitrarily unbounded tape, so it, can has, it has all this room for scratch work. But after it wants to leave <coughs> the answer, it just cleans up all the scratch work and just leaves the, only the answer. So this is a complicated Turing machine for decision. We can keep, create many Turing machines, simple Turing machines. Uh, let's do one for bit flips. Suppose we. Uh, that sigma is 0, 1. Let's give a Turing machine to flip bits. Okay, How do you flip bits in practice, like you with pen and paper? You 
read the first character, erase it, write down the opposite of it, and then move on to the next character until you, you finished. Okay, read a one, write a zero, move right, read a zero, write a one, move right. And we need to stop. The Turing machine, a computing machine, has to have some stopping condition. So we say we read the blank, we know we're out of input. So we'll just write that blank right back. And then it doesn't really matter what we read. So we'll say R. Now, a computing Turing machine, there's no regard for acceptance or rejectance. It doesn't accept or rejectance. It doesn't accept or reject. It just stops. So conventionally, it doesn't really matter. You can do a double circle. You could say QH if you can kind of construct a, a computing Turing machine. Right? This is a simple Turing machine. Let's call this Q0. Let's, let's write out some configurations of this specific Turing machine. Let's do uh, Q0101. Let's write the configurations of this Turing machine on 101. Right? What is it going to do? It's going to read the 1. It's going to write a 0 and move right. And it's going to stay at Q0. So there's going to be 0, Q0, 0, 1. Right? That's one application of the transition function. Uh, read a 0, write a 1, move right. So 0, 1, Q0, 1. Right? Read a 1, write a 0, and move right. So 0, 1, 0, Q, H, Q0. Now here, conventionally, you can bring in as many blanks as you need. Just like a number has an implicit amount of leading zeros, right? 13, 0, 13. Is just 13, right? It's kind of the same thing. You can, if you, if your configuration needs a blank, it's okay to write the blank. Read a blank, write a blank, and what did we say? Move. Let's make it more confusing. Let's just put a left here for no reason, okay? Read a blank, write a blank, and move left. Zero one Q H zero blank. Now the output is what this mapped. to 0, 1, 0. It doesn't matter where the tape head lies. Just the tape head is there. It's OK. Just who cares? Just the tape head can end anywhere. The, the, the input is delimited. The, excuse me, the output is delimited by whatever the first blank is. The output may never contain blanks. Wherever the, everything that comes before the first blank is considered the output. Right. So 0, 1, 0 is the output here. This is an example of a, of a, of a computing machine. Also. This one, how many states is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine states. This one is cool and also two states, real simple. Questions on this one? We'll give several more examples of computing devices today. Okay. Um, by the way, Turing machines in general don't have to halt, right? We mentioned that. Let's give me a Turing machine that does not halt. A machine that changes every space to a 1. Every space to a 1. But it only will do that after it reads a space. Yeah. So how does it read a space if it's in, in initialized with anything? That would work. Uh, that would definitely halt on the empty string. That would, excuse me, that would definitely not halt on the empty string. But there's, give me a, a general, more general Turing machine that doesn't halt on any input. Moves right no matter what. Yeah. Let's make even a, a, a more useless one. Let's say read A, write A, move right. Read B, write B, excuse me, write A, move right. Read a blank, write an A, move right. Okay. You may say this is a, a machine with a memory leak if you want. It reads an A, writes an A, moves right. Ad infinitum. Destruction, right? Here's our little tape head. It's reading an A, it's writing an A, and it's just gonna it's just gonna tail off forever. Nothing this this doesn't compute anything, it doesn't accept anything, it just is kind of not good programming, right? Um, let's con consider some useful functions. Consider the successor function, uh, s of n is equal to n plus one. We want to create a Turing machine for the successor function. It takes as input a number and outputs a number. Now, a cool thing is mathematical objects be, can be encoded in many ways. So we can have n encoded in a useful way. Let's consider the computable function that takes as input a unary encoding of n and outputs uh, a unary encoding of n plus 1. Okay? Suppose that the tape alphabet then is just simply 1 comma blank, right? 
um, give me a Turing machine that computes this function, this, the unary successor function. Read a one, right, or self loop, read a one, write a one, move right, and then, yeah, transition to a halting, accepting state that's read a blank, write a one, move right. Yeah, this last part doesn't really matter, the read thing. Okay. Um, how is that going to work? Well, what is unary really? Before we invented any other, you know why we use base 10 is we have 10 fingers. But before that, the caveman collected, counted by uh, an abacus. He used piles of sticks. So like, oh, wow, we have, that's four to a caveman. And that's seven. That's seven to a caveman, right? So same thing. This is, this is unary, quite simple for us to, to cr construct uh, an adder. A simple, a, a plus one device. Very simple mathematical tool. What about in binary? Suppose here sigma is uh, zero, one blank. How would you increment a binary number? I guess it depends on the order it's written in. But you get Suppose it's written in the order the computer is. I don't remember if it's little endian, big endian. But the bigger number comes first. So you want to get to the end, and then you want to... Uh, well, let's do that one at a time. Let's get to the end first, OK? I want to get to the end. How do I get to the end? You're, you start at the beginning, right? You start like this. How do I get to the end? So Self-loops for 0 and 1 until you see space. They move right, yeah. And if I, when do I stop? Uh, once you see a space. What am I going to do with this space? You want to move left. Yes, but I'm going to write that space back and move left. So now I'm at the last digit, right? The last bit, the, the, the 2 to the 0 power. Now what am I going to do? How do you carry in binary, by the way? You remember? You add 1 to a binary number, what happens? So you flip it, but if it's um, a 1, you want to carry it to the next one. Yeah, so what does that look like? I guess you could have a carry state. Um, so let's suppose you see a 0. What do you do? Uh, you just flip it to a 1. That's yeah. It. Now, if you see a 1, what do you do? When you add 1 to that, what happens? 0, 0, 0, 1, right? Just a self loop on that state of read one, write zero, move left? Yeah. Read one, write a zero, read one, write a zero, read one, write a zero, put the one there. Yeah, it's just that's how the carry works. It'll flip all those forward. Great. Um, small problem with this, though. Very small problem. You can't add, like, you, you, you've basically added, like, integer overflow. Yeah, what happens if, what, what, what is, what happens if you have, one plus that. You flip them all, and then where do you put the one, right? So rather than create a complicated branch, uh, you could, what you could do first is add an extra branch before you begin this. Turing machines are very composable, and you can think about making subroutines and helper functions the same way with Turing machines. You could make a thing, first check if the input is all zeros. You sanitize your input. Check if it's all ones. If it's all ones, shift the ones over. Start with the zero and then do this thing. So you could obviously, and I'll leave it perhaps as an exercise, to create a function that determines if you need a leading zero and then puts that zero there for you. Uh, otherwise, this is, I'm just going to say this is suppose that the input is given with a leading zero. Good enough. Questions on this one? Yeah. If we need a leading zero, can't we just sort of hard code what our answer would be? Well, what about this one? Those two may have different computations. But basically, you would do a different branch. If I read a 1, what I'm going to do, if I read all 1s, I'm going to put the, the string that I know that I need. So I would like put the first blank would be a 0, everything would be a 0, and then the first one would be a 1, something like that, right? So I would change, the, I would change for example, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 to uh, I would read this blank, and then I would write it as a 0. And then I would change these all to zeros until I found the first character. How do you find the first character? Does 
There's no thing that tells you what index you're at. So unfortunately, you may have to begin the entire computation by writing a special symbol, a helper symbol in some sense, that I'm starting here, don't lose my place. Maybe you move left, and if you are reading the same symbol that you always read, you, like if you mark symbols moving left, and you read a marked symbol again, then you know you were stayed at the same state. Some things like this have to be inferred. It's a very limited, very primitive programming language that has to cope to do basic tasks. Right. Questions? All right, let's do one more uh, quick thing. We gave a definition of what it means for a function to be computable. There's a Turing machine that halts on all inputs. Let me just make sure we have the definition of what it means for a uh, Turing machine. Uh, oh, no, excuse me, we have one more example to do. We did plus one. Let's do unary addition, right? So consider a function, uh, f, uh, we'll consider the add function. <coughs> Right. In unary, what is this going to look like? This is going to look like that's what we want. Okay. Uh, a computable function is not, by definition, multi-parametered. It takes in one element and outputs one element. But that's okay because you can delimit the input in certain ways. Right. There is no important study of uh, multi-parameter computable functions because it turns out the study is exactly the same as single input computable functions, right? It, you're looking at the same problem. So the fact that I wrote this like this and not like this doesn't really matter. How would a Turing machine take on two inputs, necessarily? They would just both be on the tape and there would be some way to tell them apart, right? Same thing, right? All, think about RAM. I mean, there's no necessary... The, uh, the concept of like this is a struct, this is the end of my array is all arbitrary. It's just ones and zeros anyway. So same thing. We'll just put a special symbol say that's the end of my input. Right? What should a Turing machine do? How should a Turing machine? Uh, give me a Turing machine that computes this, the sum, the unary sum. So, like self loop to read, reader one, writer one, go to the right, uh -huh. and then. Read a hash, write a one, go to the right. Perfect. And then. One more thing. Self loop the ones again. Uh -huh. And then make the last one a zero. Like go back and write over the A last. blank, yeah. Blank, yeah. Double check this for me. Read a one, write a blank. Move. Left it doesn't really matter. So we have one 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 hash, one 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 one, and we want to have seven ones. So what we're going to do here is we're going to erase this hash with a one. Well, great. Now we have eight. So what we're going to do is go to this one and make it a blank as well. That's all it does. Is that Turing machine correct? Any any mistakes? Any lefts or rights that shouldn't be there? I think that's right. Okay, uh, great. We gave some examples of computing machines. Let's give a definition. Uh, we say L is an element of LTM. Uh, these are called the decidable languages, or the recursive languages, or the computable languages. We'll, we'll call them decidable languages. Historically, they actually have like 10 names. Um, but we'll call them the decidable languages if there exists a Turing machine M such that, so this is a decidable or a Turing decidable language, is that if uh, W is an L, if and only if M on W accepts and halts, right? It accepts, it has to stop. W is not an L, if and only if M on W rejects. So a, a language is Turing decidable if there exists a machine a Turing machine, which is one that halts on all inputs to decide that language. A Turing machine that has an input that it may infinitely loop on, some unbounded thing it does, a bug, that is a Turing machine which doesn't decide any language. 
A Turing machine is, uh, a language is decidable if there exists a Turing machine for it. A Turing machine that halts on all inputs. That's the definition of decidability. Any questions on that? Okay.